Okay, we have another sermon request here uh, from a brother over in India, Brother Lordson Rock. Uh, I suggest looking up some of his videos on YouTube. Does a real good job. Uh, but he asked me to do a sermon on body, soul, and spirit. Explain what exactly a person is, how we are made up. Well, <clears throat> let's count that again. Body, soul, and spirit. What is that? That's three. Okay. You say, well, I thought you said just that's how somebody's made up, a person's made up. Well, a person's one, but they have three parts. Now, can anybody think of anything else that is similar to that? God. God has three parts, but he's only one. There's only one God, but he has three parts to him. And we're going to look about that in Scripture. I'm going to show you verses on the Godhead, the Trinity, as we call it. Yes, I know Trinity is not a Bible word, but it's a description. Okay, there's three in one. And I'm going to show you that that's how God is, and then that's how he made each one of us. So turn this morning in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to see exactly here how God made man. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 is where we're going to start out. Okay, it says here, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God said, I'm going to make man and he's going to be made after our likeness and in our own image. And it says here, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now that command there has never changed. Man is supposed to have dominion over everything on the earth. And when you have a society where animals and creatures have more rights than people, you have a sick society. Okay, And here in America, you can be kicked off your land because of an endangered animal or bird or fish on your property. That's not God's design. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree and the which is the fruit of a tree, tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay, so you have day six there is where God creates all the creatures on the earth, including man. <clears throat> and by the way, let me just say this, too, before we go on. Vegetarianism was there in the Garden of Eden. Okay, and I believe up until the time of the flood as well. Uh, but after the flood, things changed. You can eat meat. Why? Well, because we don't produce the kind of fruit and vegetables and herbs and seeds that they had back in the pre-flood world. Things changed. The climate changed. If you live without any kind of animal protein in the form of meat, today you're going to have health problems. Just as simple as that. And I have a video about raw milk and the guy sitting there about you will never find a fifth generation vegetarian. And that's absolutely true. You get very sickly when you're, when you're a vegetarian. You aren't going to have kids and then kids and then kids. A couple generations after being vegetarian, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, but now look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says here, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now right there in that verse, you have the three parts of man described. First, you have the body. Okay, what the, what's the flesh there, the body? Well, it's formed from the dust of the ground. And then next you have breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the spirit. Okay? And third, man became a living soul. There's three parts to man. You know why? Because there's three parts to God. That's why. And we are made in God's image after his likeness. You say, well, can you prove that there are three parts to God? 
Yes, I can. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. Now, it's going to be important that you have a King James Bible for this verse because most of the new perversions have attacked this verse. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 through 9. And here we're going to see the greatest verse in the entire Bible on the Trinity, the Godhead. Okay, 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. We're going to see more about that later. Verse 7. This is one that most of the new versions remove. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There is no greater verse that I know of that proves the Trinity, the Godhead. Verse 8, And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his son. Now, right about now, a, if there's anybody who's listening who's into the new versions and they know the issue, they're saying, this portion of scripture, verse 7, is known as the Johannine comma. That's what it's called in the scholarly world. And they say, there's no manuscript evidence for the Johannine comma. It was added. It's a gloss. You know, boy, it's real technical, isn't it? But unfortunately for them, it's not true. Here are the witnesses for the 1 John 5, 7 verse. Uh, in 170 AD, the verse appeared in the Old Syriac. 180 AD, Tatian. Okay, he was one of the early church fathers. He quoted the verse. 200 AD, Old Latin and Tertullian. In other words, a, an Old Latin Bible and then Tertullian, another church father. Okay, and I don't agree with the church fathers. And that, that's not why I'm quoting them. Okay, I wouldn't read or trust the church fathers for anything, but the point is they quote the verse, so the verse existed back there, okay, in the second century. 250, you have Cyprian quoting 1 John 5, 7. 350, you have Priscillian and Athanasius. 415, it's quoted at the Council of Carthage. 450, Jerome quotes it. 510, Fulgentius. 750, Wyenbergensis, or Wyenbergensis. 1150, it's in minuscule manuscript 88. 1200, 1300, 1400, it's in the Waldensian Bibles. And 1500, it's found in manuscript number 61. So some liar comes along to you and says that there's no evidence for 1 John 5, 7. It's, it, was, it was, you know, no Greek manuscript support. I just quoted to you a whole bunch of them. Okay? And it was quoted by church fathers back in the 2nd century. So don't let anybody deceive you into thinking, oh, it, it doesn't exist. And here I have, by the way, uh, early church fathers in the authorized version and early manuscripts in the authorized version, both by Dr. Jack Mormon of the Trinitarian Bible Society, and he documents it. He shows that the verse was quoted as early as the 2nd century. But if you go to some Bible seminary somewhere, they will lie to you and say that there's no manuscript evidence for 1 John 5, 7. And that's why they defend... Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which remove whole books of the Bible. The book of Revelation does not appear in the Vaticanus manuscript. So you have a new version. You look at the footnotes, it says, not in the two oldest and best manuscripts. Yeah, there's huge portions of the Bible that are not in those two oldest and best. Okay, And they also contain apocryphal books as part of the inspired scripture. But that's a whole other thing there. The point is, 1 John 5, 7 should be in your Bible. And if it's not, you have a false Bible. Just as simple as that. And it's interesting too because they take out verse 7 but they leave in verse 8. They'll talk about the three witnesses on earth but they don't want the three witnesses in heaven. Interesting. Very interesting. But the fact of the matter is that your King James Bible does teach that God is three but yet one. Just like man is three but yet one. Turn to John chapter 1. You'll notice there in 1 John 5, 7, it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, capital W, and the Holy Ghost. We're going to see about the Word, capital W. 
John chapter 1. And it's interesting because if you have a King James Bible, your Bible has capital W word, which is a reference to Jesus Christ. It has it seven times. The NIV takes out 1 John 5, 7, the reference there, which reduces it from 7 to 6. Hmm, interesting number, going from 7 to 6. And there are two other words I can't think right now. What The one is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and then the other, I can never remember that one. But the point is there are, it's, there are three different words, unique references to Jesus Christ. King James Bible has seven references to each of those. The NIV removes one of each. So it's 666 in the NIV, 777 in the King James Bible. And I did a video on that, and I never had anybody refute it yet. You know why? Because they can't. All they do is talk about my attitude, you know. <laughs> like that's going to prove anything. But uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. Let's see about the Word here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Tie that into 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. The same was in the beginning with God, and all, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. <clears throat> Jump down to verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Now that's a very interesting statement right there, and we're going to talk about that as we continue in our study today. I believe, and the Bible teaches this, that Jesus Christ is the body, God the Father is the soul, and the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. That's the Godhead. Now, how many people here today can see my soul? You can't see my soul. All you can see is my body. Okay, that's all you can see. So no man hath seen the soul of Brian Nellinger. See, that's what's going on here. No man on earth ever saw God the Father. Why? Because He's the soul. They saw Jesus Christ. Okay? But yet 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. So what was the flesh? The flesh was Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But another interesting thing, a lot of new versions will remove only begotten Son, and they replace it with the begotten God. So they take Son out and they replace it with God. Which is interesting because then you have two gods. One that's not begotten and then the other is begotten. Two begotten, uh, a begotten God. Okay, that's a heresy. Okay, there's only one God. And then there's a only begotten Son. And it's not one and only Son, by the way, either, as the New Versions put it. It's only begotten. <clears throat> Turn to John chapter 14, verse 6. We're going to see another Trinity verse here. John chapter 14, verse 6. Another proof that there is the Godhead is three in one. A Trinity. And this is heresy to a heretics like Muslims and things like that. They don't, you know, believe that God is three in one. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How many things did we see there in the verse? The way, the truth, the life. What do we have? We have three say, what's the tie-in? John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus speaking says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So what is Jesus? He's the way into heaven. <clears throat> uh, John 16, verse 13, we have, it says here, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. That's how he speak, and he will show you things to come. Okay? So what do we have there? The Spirit of Truth is the Holy Spirit. Okay, according to John 16, 13. What do we just read? I am the way, the truth. Interesting. What about the life? 
What do we have there? Well, what we read earlier, Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Who gives life in this universe? God does. And if something wants to be born, and God's not for it, they're not going to be able to be born. God gives life. So what we have there is the Trinity right in verse 6. The way is Jesus Christ. The truth is the Holy Spirit. And the life is God the Father. So again, you have another verse that proves the Trinity. The Godhead. Turn to John. Well, actually, we're right there. Uh, John 14, verse 8. <clears throat> and this is interesting here. Notice the wording here. John chapter 14, verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth, sufficeth us. They want to, you know, show us the Father. We'd like to see the Father. Look at Jesus' reaction here in verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He doesn't say, you've not known God the Father. He says, you don't know me, Philip? What's he saying? He's saying that he is the Father. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Was Jesus Christ God the Father? Absolutely. Absolutely. But you see, God the Father is the soul within Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost within Jesus was the Spirit. Three in one. But as people, you know, very carnal people, we look and we say, but I don't see three. All I see is one. That doesn't make any sense. You know, show me the Father. He can't show him the Father. Because God the Father is in him. You know, just the same as I can't say, okay... I'm going to, you know, hold my breath here and my soul's going to pop out here and my and my spirit's going <clears> to <throat> jump out here to the other side and you'll get to see all three parts of Brian Denlinger. I can't do that. Okay? <clears throat> the three parts of Brian Denlinger are right here in front of you as one entity. <clears throat> I can't split off my three parts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at uh, verse 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. <clears throat> now notice Jesus does not say, I will not leave you comfortless. I'll send uh, the Holy Spirit to you. He doesn't say that. He says, I will come to you. You know why? Because Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Okay, the comforter that has come, you say, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. Yes, but it's also Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the Godhead. That's the Trinity there. Again, we see that. <clears throat> John chapter 15. And one of the titles for God in your Bible, is I am. He says, I am that I am, back in Exodus. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear itself or fruit of itself, Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same, same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That doesn't mean if you're reading God's word that you can ask for anything and he'll answer. Okay? 
<clears throat> well, actually, he will answer, and, and the answer sometimes will be no. <laughs> the point is, if you're abiding in the Word of God and you know the Word of God, you aren't going to pray for things that are contrary to Scripture. You aren't going to pray for great riches and great fame because you know that that would be contrary to Scripture. You aren't going to pray for world peace because you know that's not going to happen apart from Jesus Christ coming and setting up a military dictatorship. Okay? <clears throat> You're going to ask for things according to Scripture. But you see it there again. Jesus Christ is the vine and we are the branches. Now somebody says, I don't want to be connected to the vine. I don't want to be saved. Okay. Snip. Now you're down on the ground. You're just a dead branch laying there. And people come along and they gather them up and they throw them into the fire and burn them. That's what the Lord's going to do to those that are lost, those that are not saved, those that are not connected, not part of God's family. <clears throat> Turn to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to see a little bit more of this here. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. If you are saved, then you are part of Jesus Christ. You are part of His body. You know, it's kind of interesting because if you take a vine and have little branches coming off, it's kind of like little arms, you know, coming off. The branches are part of the vine. And we, as Christians, are part of the body of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Okay, through his blood is removed from the new versions there again. Why? Because they're satanic. Verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Jesus is the, in, the image of the invisible God. No man can see God. Why? Because he's the soul of the Godhead. Okay? You see it right there again. Look at verse 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. I love that verse right there. It doesn't matter how wicked and evil an atheist or anybody out there is. They consist. They get their life from Jesus Christ. The one that they deny and they, they say, oh, he doesn't exist and all this stuff and they hate him. And yet, they couldn't take another breath if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. <laughs> kind of funny. Verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Hmm. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Um, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Okay? So you see it there again. All things are connected to Jesus Christ, whether they want to be or not. I love that. Turn back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 verse 54 is where we're going to go. Okay, it says here, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, now look at what he says here, Before Abraham was, I am. He just told them that he was God. And look at their reaction. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why did they get so mad that they wanted to kill Jesus? 
because he just told them that he was God. And they didn't believe it. <laughs> you know? Very interesting there. You know, I remember... Uh, um, I, you know, I've heard different false prophets say that you know Jesus never claimed to be God or something like this. Right there, he did. If he would have just said, you know, well, you know, I'm 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 okay with God or something, well, they wouldn't have gotten mad enough to kill him. But because he said I am, you know, gave it the title of God of himself, that's why they took stones up to kill him. John chapter eighteen. John chapter 18, verse 1. John 18, verse 1. It says here, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where he was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Hmm. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. I did it again. I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now what about that? Isn't that interesting? That's exactly what happened there. And a lot of people are ignorant of that. They don't, you know, you'll see plays in churches, you know, and, the, and they just have the soldiers come and grab Jesus and haul him off to, to the cross. That's not what happened. He said, I am he. And they all fell backwards. You see, the power of God's words can knock people over and can do tremendous and amazing things. And the full fulfillment of this thing is going to be in Revelation chapter 19. When Jesus Christ comes back and we come back with Him, if you're saved, one of the, you know, one of the saints, you're going to be coming back with Jesus Christ and He's going to open His mouth and the sharp two-edged sword comes out and kills 200 million man army. Just, whew. Why? Because it's His Word that has power. See, Jesus could go down there with a big sword and, and hack everybody and beat everybody up with His fists or something, karate kick them and stuff. But He doesn't need to do that. You see, God's Word is powerful. The most powerful thing in the universe. That's why it's magnified above His name, according to Scripture. God's Word has power. So if you want to have power as a Christian, you need to quote God's Word. That's where the power is. God's Word can knock people over. God's Word can destroy armies. And it will one day. But you say, okay, I see all this. You know, I see this thing of, of how, you know, you have the Godhead there. Jesus Christ is God. He is the great I Am. But how does this relate to us? How does this relate, relate to man? Ephesians chapter 1. And, you know, I've said this many, many times, and I'll say it one more time, and that is when you're doing these studies, a lot of times there are just so many verses, and it's like, man, I could, I could preach for three hours on this thing, but I usually try to keep my sermons to about an hour uh, in length. But there's so many more verses. If you want to, excuse me, if you want to do your own study, there are so many more verses that you could hit on the subject of the Godhead, on the subject of body, soul, and spirit. But uh, we're just going to hit the most, the, the clearest ones today. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 says here that the God of our uh, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of His glory, or what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? You do have power as a Christian. Don't think that you're powerless down here. Why? Well, you have the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Verse 20, 
which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, the millennial kingdom there. And hath put all things under under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. Don't get too worried about people here in this world. A lot of Christians get fearful at the military police state that's coming, the new world order. They get all scared about that stuff. But right there, verse 21 says, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named. Okay, Jesus Christ has more power than anybody in this world, and you are part of his body. That's something to think about. Okay, look at verse or chapter 2, verse 1. Now here's where it's interesting. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus." Let me just stop there for just a minute. It doesn't say, and will raise us up later on, and, and we'll sit together eventually in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. It doesn't say that. That's present tense. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you know that if you're saved, you are in Christ Jesus? Meaning that you are seated with him right now in heaven? That's a very interesting thing there. And by the way, it's also a very good proof for eternal security. You see, if you're seated together in heavenly places with Jesus Christ, you're not going to be unseated and then reseated again when you get resaved and then unseated again when you sin and then reseated. That's nonsense. Once you become part of the body of Christ, he's not going to perform an amputation. All right? You are sealed until the day of redemption. That's what the Bible says. Verse 13 over there in chapter 1, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Don't fall for the thing that you can lose your salvation. That's what self-righteous people believe. But look at verse 7 here. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in, in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And I've said it again, I'll say it one more time. It's the blood of Christ that redeems you, not his death. And if some heretic like John MacArthur tells you, or one of his students, because you know, the guy's got a university now, <laughs> God help us, you know, one of his pupils or he himself says it's the death of Christ, Call them a liar, because they are liars. They're quite ignorant of Scripture. Right? It's the blood of Christ that saves you, that redeems you. But, as Gentiles in the past, we were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. We had no hope, no hope of salvation. We were destined for hell. But now, we who sometimes, in the past, we were far off, were now made nigh by the blood of Christ. And you talk about being made nigh, which means near. You can't get any nearer than to be part of the body of Christ, part of his physical body. So, what do you see there? Well, man is born as a living soul with the breath of life in his body. The spirit in man is there, but it's dead in sin. At salvation, the Holy Spirit comes in and the spirit is quickened. 
I'm going to demonstrate this in just a minute. The soul is redeemed and will live forever in heaven. Okay? But now here's the tricky part. The body of flesh remains corruptible, and the spirit and soul need to fight against the corruption of the flesh. So if you're a Christian, you are two-thirds saved. Two-thirds redeemed. Your flesh is not redeemed. Your, your body of flesh is not saved. Your body of flesh, if you let it, it can go and do any of the sins that the lost world can do. Okay? It's not that you'll go over to a bottle of alcohol and go to reach for it and a little force field goes boing, you know, and, and I, I can't touch the alcohol. <laughs> no, you can touch it. If you go to look at uh, some filthy pictures or something like that, you can look at them. If you want to swear, you can swear. Why? Because your flesh isn't redeemed. And that's why your soul and your spirit are constantly fighting with your flesh. Now you say, well, could you demonstrate this thing? Absolutely. You want to see a trinity? I'm going to show you a trinity right here. You say, are you kidding me? You know, you, you, know, you on the sermon there, you're listening, you can't see this, but I'm holding up a TV remote right now. Now I'm going to show you this thing. Right now you're seeing the outward appearance of the remote. Do you see the circuit board that's in there? The computer chip and whatever else is in this thing? No. But I'm going to show you that there is one in there. And can you see the batteries? No, you can see the compartment for the batteries, but you can't see them. Now watch. I just turned that TV on over there. There, I shut it off again. Now, I want to show you what a, what a lost person is. Okay, that's a saved person. They have the batteries in them. They're alive. They're living spiritually. Here, I took the battery out. Now watch what happens. I'm going to turn the TV on. I said I'm going to turn the TV on. Doesn't work. What happened? Well, the spirit will say the battery there is gone. It's dead. Okay, and if you have dead batteries, by the way, it does the same thing as taking them out. The remote control doesn't work. Okay, you have the batteries in there, we'll say, but they're dead. That's what a lost person is. A lost person is dead in trespasses and sins. They cannot understand spiritual things. They can fake it, and we're going to see that here as we continue. But the point is, this right here is a picture of what we are like. Okay? You say, how do you, what do you mean? Well, on the outside, we look fine, but you can't see the soul within. And when you get saved, your spirit becomes quickened. It becomes alive. And now, all of a sudden, those things that you couldn't understand about the Bible and about our relationship with God, now, all of a sudden, the remote works. Our little body here works. And now we can pray to God, and God can show us things, and God can convict us, God can speak to us through His Word. Why? Well, because our batteries are charged now. And it's interesting, too, because I'm not going to take the battery back out of this remote again, but if you look at a battery, it has a positive and a negative end to it, which is interesting, because the Holy Spirit is both positive and negative. He'll show you things that are positive. He'll show you things that are negative. Okay, he'll, he'll bless you, but he'll also convict you. Okay, and don't think that the Holy Spirit's just going to be all positive. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, turn back there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17. And this is why, you know, when you start to witness to the lost world, they'll try to use the remote control with dead batteries inside. They try to figure out God without salvation. You can't do it. You cannot understand God if you have no salvation. If your batteries are dead, if you are dead in trespasses and sins, you can try all you want to. You're not going to understand God. You aren't, you're not going to understand the Bible. You're going to have all these questions and all oh, the Bible contradicts. There are no contradictions in the King James Bible unless you're lost and the Holy Spirit can't reveal the answers to things. And you can find all kinds of contradictions. But let's look here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. 
Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Until you come to God as a sinner and repent of those sins and ask Jesus Christ to save you, until you do that, you're not going to understand the Bible. You say, well, I'll go to the university, I'll get a PhD and all this other stuff. Not going to do anything. Why? God makes the wisdom of the world foolish. Okay? He doesn't choose education, the educational system, as his system of revelation. What is his system of revelation? The foolishness of preaching. I have to stand up here and preach to the lost world that a Jew 2,000 years ago died on a wooden cross, was whipped and, and, and killed, and that his blood is enough to save you. To the world, that looks foolish. That looks like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Some Jew 2,000 years ago can save me and I can go to heaven when I die? Yep. You have to admit to being a sinner according to the standards of Scripture, and you have to get, accept that Jew that died on the cross and his blood to pay for your sins. Well, I don't think I could believe that. Okay. Conversation's over. Sorry. <laughs> Just the way it is. Look at uh, chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. <clears throat> it says here, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. <clears throat> How many stupid theories have, have the lost world dreamt up, and now they've been proven wrong, and you just kind of go on and forget what they said back then. <clears throat> you know, evolution, they used to say that the world was a couple million years old, and it was a couple hundred million years old, now it's a couple billion years old. The wisdom of this world is going to come to naught. Evolution is a stupid theory. Verse 7, <clears throat> But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Prince is kind of like Pilate that said, What is truth? He didn't understand what was going on. And if he did, if he had known that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, he wouldn't have crucified him. <laughs> not at all. <clears throat> Verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Verse 14, look at this one. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. What did, you, what, what did we just read there in chapter 1? The preaching of the cross is foolishness to the lost world. <clears throat> Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay, if you are a Christian and you're reading God's Word, you'll understand things like the Lord sees things. Okay, salvation quickens your spirit and opens your understanding. That's what's going on there. And you say, wait a second. If that's true, why are there so many lost people that are quote-unquote religious? If their spirit is dead, how can they understand certain things about the Bible? Let me show you that. James chapter 2, verse 19. <clears throat> I'm virtually acting up today. Apologize for that. James chapter 2, verse 19. Is it possible when a person, a lost person, is walking around with dead batteries, their, their spirit is dead, is it possible for them to get some energy from another source, from another spirit? Oh yeah, you better believe it. 
And I'm going to show you the other source that people can be energized from. James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. That's good. You believe there's one God. But look at the rest of the verse. The devils also believe and tremble. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? The devils also believe that there's one God. And they tremble. What does the Bible say about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Did you know that somebody could have a spirit of a devil in them and tremble at God and believe that there's only one God? Effectively believe the Word of God? They could appear very devout, couldn't they? And people say, well, I think you're kind of stretching the thing here. All right, we're going to do a little exercise today. Turn to two different places. Matthew chapter 16. Get that in one hand. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. <clears throat> Matthew 16, verse 15 and seven, through 17. Excuse me. And then with your other hand, get Luke chapter 4, verse 33. Luke chapter 4, verse 33. I'm going to show you a very amazing thing here in Scripture. A lot of people don't aren't going to teach you this one. So in your in your left hand there you have Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, and in your right hand, Luke chapter 4, verse 33. Okay, you ready? Alright, Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. 15 it says here he saith unto them but whom say ye that i am jesus questioning his disciples verse 16 and simon peter answered and said thou art the christ the son of the living god verse 17 and jesus answered and said unto him blessed art thou simon barjona for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee but my father which is in heaven okay what did he say Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, You didn't get that figured out from looking at me. Flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Keep your hand there and flip over to Luke chapter 4, verse 33. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Look over at verse 41 there in the same chapter. It says here, And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. So you have people that are possessed with devils, and they're saying, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But over here, Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. They're both saying the same thing. Yet one is, it's revealed to them from God the Father. The other, it's demon spirits. Demonic spirits. Can people that are possessed with devils speak like religious people? Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm going to just, you know, ruin your day out there if you're a positive thinker. The majority of people who are quote unquote in religion, you know, organized religion, the majority of them are speaking with the power of devils. I'll tell you that right now. The majority of people out there who are in religion are not saved. I guarantee you that. You take Catholic and, and any of these people like that, there are some very devout Catholics out there. They'll pray for hours and hours and hours a day. They'll do all kinds of, give up all kinds of things and live a self-sacrificing life and whatever. There are some very devout Catholics out there and they can say a lot of nice things about Jesus Christ. But they're not doing it with the power of the Holy Spirit. They don't have the batteries of the Holy Spirit. Their spirit is charged and energized by another system, another spirit. And it's a spirit of a devil. <clears throat> So many people have, I have here, uh, many lost people have their spirit quickened, but it's the wrong spirit. <laughs> Just wanted to say that quick. Now we're going to do another one here. Turn to Mark chapter 14. Get that in one hand. Mark chapter 14, verse 57. 
I want to show you another thing here that's important to understand. Mark chapter 14. Mark 14, verse 57. Okay, and then in your other hand, go back into the Pauline epistles there, get Colossians chapter 2. So with your left hand, you want Mark chapter 14, verse 57. Right hand, get Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Getting a little Bible work out today. <clears throat> Mark chapter 14, left hand, and Colossians chapter 2 in your right hand. Okay, let's start out here in Mark chapter 14, verse 57. It says here, And there arose certain and bare false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Okay, did Jesus give that as a prophecy? Yep, he certainly did. Did they understand what he meant by that? No. They were thinking of the physical temple. But what Jesus was talking about was his body. And he said, I'm going to make another temple. Notice it says there in verse 58, I will build another made without hands. That's very important. A temple made without hands. Keep your hand there and turn over to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. It says here, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses okay that's a very interesting thing there you see because first corinthians 6 19 through 20 we won't turn there i'll just read it says what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and ye are not your own for ye are bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are god's Okay, the New Testament church that was set up by Jesus Christ is our bodies. Okay, that's very important to understand. Not the uh, First Baptist Church or something, you know, by the way. Not a, a building. Okay, the church in Scripture, in your New Testament, is a reference to our body. The body of believers. It's a living building. It's not a dead building of brick and mortar and wood and whatever. Okay, that's an important thing. The Old Testament temple was connected, had a system there where the soul was connected to the flesh. That's why you go back to the book of Leviticus and there's all these laws about being clean and unclean and you can't eat this and you can't touch that. And you're, if you do, you're unclean for seven days and you've got to go to the priest and you've got to do this and that. And it's interesting there because back in the Old Testament, over and over and over again, and we're not going to go look all these up because there's a lot of them, but it says about the soul that sinneth it shall die. Wait a second. Where's that at in the New Testament? It's not there. In the New Testament, your soul is cut loose from your flesh. That's what we just read there. The circumcision made without hands. The temple that was created by Jesus Christ is your body. Okay? So, in other words, what you touch, if you touch something, I'm not saying you can just go out and sin and it won't affect you. Okay, it won't affect your eternity, but it will affect your rewards and your life down here but the fact is now if you touch something it does not affect your soul your soul is redeemed all right it's a different system that we are under uh and like i said you know our soul is not affected by our flesh but we still must mortify the flesh we still have to take care of our bodies turn to romans chapter 7 we're going to see this thing here and like I said, there are so many verses that you could use in this study. Uh, I, I just couldn't cover everything for sake of time. Romans chapter 7, we're going to look at verse 17. And we're going to see this thing carried out here. The thing of the soul not being affected by the flesh. 
Okay, it says here, Romans chapter 7, verse 17, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh. It doesn't say in my soul or in my spirit. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Okay, and you know, look down at verse 24. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, in other words, your soul and your spirit are redeemed. Your flesh is not. The third part of you is not redeemed. And when you sin, it's not the sin is not in your soul or in your spirit. It's in your flesh. That's what Christians will, will have struggles with. And if you see a Christian and they're having struggles with their flesh, well, try to have some grace for them. You still need to reprove them. You still need to rebuke them. You need to exhort them when you see a Christian that's struggling with their flesh. But when you start to see a professing Christian and they're having all kinds of spiritual problems, spirit-type problems, and, and doing weird things and coming up with all kinds of heretical beliefs and false doctrines and stuff like that, that's when you can start to say, I think I have to question their salvation. And when they can't understand things of the Spirit and when you try to talk to them and there's just that fellowship of the Spirit is just not there. Now, you might get a, a newer Christian that doesn't quite understand all the heavy doctrine type of stuff. You know, you need to have grace there. But you get somebody who's been saved 20 or 30 years and they believe and teach all kinds of heresy, you know, you're probably dealing with somebody who's lost. So be real careful about that. Okay, if, if you're a Christian, be careful, you know, when it comes to other Christians having struggles with their flesh because all Christians do. You know, and, I'm, and again, I'm not justifying it. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 12. <clears throat> you say, well, what happens if I live after the flesh? Well, we'll read about it. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are, are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You say, well, how do I do that? Turn over to Galatians. Chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. You say, mortify, that, that kind of sounds negative, doesn't it? <laughs> yep, it certainly does. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Okay? Look down at verse 24. You can go through the list there of the works of the flesh from 19 to 21, and then the fruit of the Spirit, 22 to 23. And that's a good, uh, kind of like brushing your teeth every day, you know. You should kind of brush up on your own life as a Christian, and say, am I doing the things in verses 19 through 21? If so, you need to quit it. You need to judge yourself. Verses 22 to 23, are those things manifest in your life? You say, well, maybe not really. Eh, then you better get it, that thing covered. If you want to hear more on the fruit of the Spirit, then you, need to, you can listen to our sermon on that. But look at verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay? But look at verse 24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. You know what you have to do if you want to be anything as a Christian? You don't want to fall into sin? You have to have a war against your flesh. All the time. And it's, it's, it's difficult because you have to take care of your flesh. You have to eat. You have to bathe. You have to sleep. But be careful you don't go too far with that. You know, you can spend too much time with health issues and forsake Scripture. You know, there's a lot of people that become vegetarian so that they can be in better health. And a lot of times they end up getting messed up as a result. They go too far with it. You know, there's a lot of people that say, I have to sleep and whatever, and they go too far with it. They become lazy. You know, that can happen. There are other people who say, you know, 
I mean, you can go on and on and on. You have to take care of your flesh, but don't let your flesh control you. Okay, and, and you say, well, how do I avoid doing that? Well, feed your spirit. Read the Bible. Listen to the right kind of music. Don't listen to fleshly music. Okay, even if it's an advertisement or something, mute it. Shut it off. Don't give your flesh any opportunity to hear fleshly music. It's not good. <clears throat> and by the way, a lot of people say, you know, I've heard this, they'll say, well, you know, I don't really see this thing, this this war, you know, between my flesh and my spirit. I don't, you know, I don't really see it. If that's the way you believe, let me tell you something, your flesh took over a long time ago. <laughs> if you're at peace with your flesh, your flesh is in control. All right, a lot of these modern Christians are so fleshly and carnal, and they think that they're spiritual. Uh -uh. Most of the modern churches, it's about what makes them feel good. And it's not the spirit, either, that's, that's the feelings, it's their flesh. That's why they like to come as they are, and they like the coffee and donuts during the service, and they like the music, and they like the entertainment. Because it, it magnifies their flesh. All right, we're going to look at one more verse here. <clears throat> and we're going to see the best method of warfare against your sinful flesh. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And you can study this thing out too. The believers in Thessalonica were a pretty strong church. They weren't like the Corinthians. They weren't carnal and fleshly. They were very strong. And Paul commends them. And you're going to see here, he gives them some last instructions on how that they can have a war against their flesh. Alright, it says here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you. <clears throat> kind of remember a sermon on exhortation there. You know, if you haven't heard the sermon on exhortation, you should listen to that one. Because uh, that's an important thing to do. Now we exhort you, brethren, <clears throat> warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. <clears throat> be patient. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. You know, Christians should live above uh, the standards of the world. We should be considered as good people. Doesn't mean we're going to get along with everybody, but we should, you know, try to be at peace with people. And, you know, <clears throat> somebody, you witness to them and they don't want to hear it, just go away. Leave them alone. Verse 16, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. Be thankful for whatever the Lord does in your life. Don't just let the Lord give you some amazing blessing and then just be like, yeah, whatever. Thank Him. Thank Him for everything. Even bad things that come into your life. Even trials and tribulations. Thank the Lord for everything. Verse 19. Quench not the Spirit. Would Paul have written that if you you know, couldn't quench the Spirit? No, of course not. He wrote that as a warning. You can quench the Spirit. How? By letting the flesh take over. Quench not the Spirit. Verse 20. Despise not prophesyings. There are things that are coming in the future that are prophesied in, in the Bible, and you better not despise them. And you say, well, that's easy to do. Oh, not really. I know a lot of Christians that you talk to them about the rapture, and they'll go, oh, yeah, no, come on. That ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen for probably another hundred years yet. Well, you know, the things are happening right now in the world that's looking like the New World Order is coming in, the Mark of the Beast technology is right there. Ah, oh, I don't want to hear about it. What are they doing? They're despising prophesying. Oh, I think that the election is going to be good. I think we're going to bring back America and restore the republic and all this stuff. It's not what the Bible says. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, a lot of people get wrapped up in all this election stuff. I'll tell you what, I mean, we talked about it last night. You know, Ron Paul, the hope for the, you know, re restoring the republic is backing out. And his son is endorsing Mitt Romney. You know? That's a bad thing. It's not a good thing. But you see, that's what the Bible prophesies. Despise not prophesying. 
I'm sorry, I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and tell you that things are going to get better in America. They're not. And if you despise that, well, that's between you and the Lord. Verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Don't move, hold fast. Be fastened to things that are good. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. How much TV can you watch? How many movies can you watch? How much stuff can you watch on the internet if you abide by that verse? Hmm. Verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, now look at this, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved unto the coming of, or be preserved blameless, excuse me, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Body, soul, spirit. We are created in God's image and after His likeness. God is three in one, and so are each one of you. We are all three parts in one. And you better make sure that your spirit is quickened and your soul is redeemed, and you better mortify and crucify your flesh if you're saved. That's a very important thing to do. So the future of saved Christians is, if you get saved as a Christian, your spirit will be quickened, your soul is redeemed, and your body is going to be inc uh, become, eventually it will become incorruptible at the rapture. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Your body will not be redeemed until Jesus Christ comes back for his bride. And that's when the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? And you can read about that too in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And by the way, if you say, well, it's all, that's the second coming, and you can listen to my studies on the rapture, it's not the second coming. There's no dead saints coming up at Christ's second coming. Go back and read Matthew chapter 24. It's not in there. Okay? That's a whole big other thing. But that's the future for you if you're a saved Christian. Eventually, all three parts of you will be redeemed. All three parts are going to be incorruptible when we're with Jesus Christ and not before. Right now on this earth, your body will be corruptible. Your flesh will sin, prone to wander, as one old song, old hymn used to say. What about the future of lost people? Well, their spirit is going to remain dead. They're not going to be able to understand Scripture. Their soul is lost. It's not redeemed. And their body will burn in hell forever. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 20. The great white throne judgment. And there's some theories there as to, you know, the eternal state of their flesh, that they might become like their father, the devil, and become a red serpent. I can't get into all that right now, but uh, Ruckman has some good stuff on that. So, those are your two options. If you're listening to this message and you're saved, well, you are a trinity. And I don't mean that you are God, or a little God, not at all. God designed you after His own image and His likeness. But that doesn't mean you have the powers of God. You don't. Okay? And if you are lost and you're listening to this, you are also a trinity. But there are certain parts of you that are, that are malfunctioning, that are not working. You're like that remote control there that doesn't have any batteries in it and you can't turn on that connection between you and God. God that you're supposed to be tied to, the vine that you're supposed to be tied to, you don't have that communication because your batteries are dead. And what you need to do, you have all the, you know, the lost people have all the capability of understanding God, but they're never going to be able to do it until they get saved. It's a very, very important thing to look into there. And uh, like I said, there's a bunch of other scriptures we could have covered here to talk about this thing, but um, you can look those up on your own. Look up references to the spirit. Look up references to the soul, to the body. You know, there's so many angles that you go at this thing from. But anybody that tells you that there is no such thing as the Trinity does not know Scripture. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but they don't. Um, there's a whole thing of the oneness. You know, there's a whole sect of people that believe in oneness. They don't believe in the Trinity. Uh, that's ridiculous. Okay? Man is a Trinity. Man has three parts to him. We just read about it here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. So don't fall for people that try to tell you that there is no Godhead, that there is no Trinity. And keep in mind 
that you have to keep your body down. You have to keep your flesh crucified. So that's going to be it for this morning. We'll close here with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, that we do have, as Christians, we do have that ability to understand your word. Our spirits are quickened. Our souls are redeemed. And someday, Lord, our bodies will be incorruptible. They will be made immortal, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And uh, I can speak, I can't speak for everybody out there listening, but I can speak for myself, and that is that I long for that day, Lord. I long for the day that I'll never have to worry about sinning again, that I'll be able to be with you in heaven and have all the other saints there, all, all my loved ones, my, my brothers and sisters in Christ from all over the world, and we'll all be up there, Lord, and we'll understand things as, and see things as you see them. There won't be any doctrinal disputes in heaven, and there won't be any sin in heaven. And just to be able to experience a body of flesh that never sins, that never does anything wrong. That's going to be a, a wonderful, glorious day, Lord. And I pray for that day that you would make it soon. I don't have anything down here on this earth, Lord, that I'd rather do than, than that would make me want to put off the rapture. I pray, Lord, that it comes soon. Uh, but until then, Lord, I pray that for all of us listening and for myself also that we would do battle with our flesh and fight with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the King James Bible. Not mess with the new versions that come from Alexandria, Egypt, the false versions that attack verses like 1 John 5, 7, and many, many other places, Lord. I could just go off on a tangent on that. But I just pray, Lord, that all those people out there would listen and take heed to the things that were spoken this morning and remember that they are there are three parts to them and not be talked out of that by any false prophet out there. And so I just uh, thank you, Lord, for your word, and I pray that you would watch over and keep your children until your coming. And I just pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.